Ladies and gentlemen, if you would kindly take your seats, we would continue with our program. As you know, this is the last keynote or the fourth keynote of Eurodig, uh, and uh, we, it will be followed by the fourth or the last panel. Uh, it is my uh, distinct pleasure and privilege to introduce to the floor Mr. Joran Marbi, the CEO and President of ICANN, for a keynote speech. You have the floor, Joran. Thank you. You're welcome. Please come in, sit down. Four minutes ago, I was afraid that no one would come into the room and I would be alone here with my staff. Don't be shy. I am the last key speaker here, so after me, it's over. Do you think I still want to listen to me as well? Thank you. Thank you. There seems to be some interesting discussions. Anyway, first of all, for personal reasons, I have to say it's, it's, um, I'm very happy to, back, to be back here in Tallinn. Um, I had a pleasure for many years to work for a company that had operations here in, in Estonia. And we had the best office in all our places here because it was actually on the beach. It was on the beach on pillars, and that's still the best office I ever had in my life. So for some reason, we had all our regional meetings here in Tallinn. And it's sort of interesting because I started coming here 15, 20 years ago. And the change this country has gone through during that period of time is staggering and amazing. And it also shows that if you use something like the internet or using this technology, it can really make a change very, very fast. And I applaud what is done in this country using this technology. Thank you. I also like the city in itself. Anyway, I've been listening to a lot of your conversations in the last couple of days, and I have to say that I'm really impressed with the quality of the discussions. To some extent, maybe they have been very timely, because over the last couple of weeks and months, a lot of questions have been raised about internet and the use of internet and the bad influence of internet. And that discussion has its place. I think it's important. But representing ICANN, we should also remember that despite what many people think, internet is not, is not a natural resource. It's a set of technologies working together and different partners. We at ICANN work very closely with our partners. Yes, please sit down. Thank you. We work very closely with our partners in the parameters, the protocols, and the number space. And that cooperation actually builds on the basis of what we call internet. But remember, it's only 25 years ago, and I know that ISOC is celebrating the birth of internet 25 years ago, um, in, I think it's September or something, in California. That happened to be the same year as my daughter was born. So when my daughter, first daughter was born, I couldn't post it online. I actually had to use a telephone. And that telephone was actually fixed to a wall. Anyone here remember that time? Half of you were probably not born. Yeah, my staff raises their hands. And it's kind of interesting that I have to explain to my other kids, when I was young, I had to stand at a wall talking to someone because I was connected. And if you called someone, your first question was, who is it? Now the question is, where are you? In a very short period of time, everything has changed. A lot of discussions that has been around here is about content. It's about how to utilize content better and all the challenges it produces. I'm also here to talk about, don't forget it is a technology. Because the interconnectivity of internet, this is what makes four billion users using the same system, is built on parameters that is set and fixed. It is a box. And I've seen that some of the discussions here has been about capacity building in that sense, that I think that we collectively have a role right now to explain that some of the good causes that are discussed about the threats of internet, we actually have to go up and tell our internet actually works technology-wise. Because if we don't do that, there is a potential that for good intentions, 
people will do legislations or other initiatives that will take away the interoperability of internet, which will actually decreate what we call the open internet going forward. We reached a point where internet is not only something which was started 25 years ago as an educational program. It was people working together in the universities around the world that really created internet. That the internet today is something that actually connects people on so many different layers. A lot of the decisions we are making today, we do that with the help of internet. Anything from our love life, how we do education, how we do our banking, a lot of those things that we did in analog before, we now do on internet. And that's kind of amazing. It's also the reasons why we have a multi-stakeholder model in, in ICANN. Because your internet might be different from my internet, and we need to make sure that everybody comes on board and have their say how we build the next generation internet. This is not only governments. Government actually, in democratic countries, only takes a fraction of this. So the multi-stakeholder model makes it possible to engage in this fora and other fora in such a way that your views and ambitions can be taken into account. But going back, it is a technology. And ICANN is about technology. We have a very limited set of things we do. We are not the internet, but we are an essential part of what you call the internet. The main aim system, and together with our partners for the IANA functions, we actually control and some of the identifiers and secure the stability of what they call the internet. That is the set we have to protect for the interoperability. And I ask you all to engage in that discussion as well. The policy discussions about what happens on top of internet will always be important, but just to make sure that we don't forget the underlying functionality. And it's actually, to your point, a lot of discussion here has been about it. I had the pleasure of having some of my members from my team who works with what we call the OCTA, the, um, the office of the CTO. We love acronyms in this soup. Who's been sharing and sharing how we actually works with the stability of the internet in practice. And one of the things we're doing, and I have to say this in all my speeches, is a small thing we do in October 11. Does anyone here miss what's happened on October 11? Or let's we do it the other way around. How many people know what we're doing October 11? Yeah, the people I spoke to today, apparently. <laughs> okay. So, a basic theory about this. One of the things we do is to make sure that you write in a domain name, a URL, you come to a web page. One way of making secure that you actually end up at the right web page is something we call DNSSEC. That's a security system to make sure that you don't end up in a fraudulent web page. I think it's about 25, 30% of all uh, ISPs in the world is using this system, and the rest one maybe you should avoid. This is a part of security and stability. October 11, we're updating the password for the system. And that's good to know. Because your ISP has to prepare that. If your ISP hasn't prepared that, you will basically not reach websites on the internet. We, of course, foresee no problems at all. This is going to be very smoothly. That's why we keep talking about it all the time. So it's nothing you do as end users, but there's any representative of ISPs here and you didn't know about this, you're going to get a letter from us or the regulator because that's the way we're doing it. Very important. Right now, a lot of discussions about the internet seems to be negative. We talk a lot about the threats, we talk about illegal content, we talk about some of those things we see that we don't like, morally or ethically or culturally. I think it's also important to, and that is an important discussion to have, but it's very problem-oriented. And we shouldn't forget the good things. Many of my staff and people who are engaged in ICANN is doing this for a simple reason. We believe in the power of internet. We believe in this thing that when you actually connect people, something magical happens. And this system now connecting four billion people around the world is a unique system to connect people. And when you connect, you can share. And when you share, it grows. That is the underlying reasons why I'm doing this personally. A lot of the people working for me and are engaged in ICANN. 
And we should never forget in all these problematic discussions that we have that Internet makes a difference and you can make a difference on Internet. And it's actually very positive. Yes, there are important discussions to have, but please help me of adding in and blending in the positive things. Everything you can do that you couldn't do, like posting pictures of my child on Facebook when she was born. Actually, when I got my third and last child, I couldn't post it because Facebook didn't exist then. Internet is not done. We have, with 4 billion users, and according to the UN development goals, it's going to be, if I understand it correctly, they have a goal to make sure that 1.5 billion users is going to be connected until 2023 or something. Those people will be different from the ones who's connected now. Actually, we could say that the people who are connected now have been the easy one. They've been the elite, the people living in cities, in societies, who can afford to develop internet. The next generation will come much more from the outskirts, um, in the rural areas, in South America, in Asia, in Africa, in countries with huge populations like China and India. They will be preferably mobile, because that's the access form they will have. They will not have the same context of internet as we have today. And internet is a fantastic thing because it's both global and local. Yes, you can go online and go around the world, but if you look at traffic, you will actually see that most of the traffic goes inside your country. So now we're entering a space where local languages and local scripts is becoming much more important. It's something that's going to be essential for us developing the next generation of internet users. And we want more internet users on the system because we want to have it bigger. And I think everybody needs to engage in this one. We need a diversity to understand the local needs of internet going forward. And I need your help on that. And I ask you humbly to engage in ICANN and in other formats with a thought in mind, not only about the users here in this room, but also the users who doesn't have the same concept as we have. Religious, cultural, ethnic, or anyone else. That's going to be the next more important users. And we have to fulfill this obligation to us and to the next generation. And one thing more as a finish of this one. We've never done this before. I'm often meeting people who ask me, why did you do that? How did you end up there? And the simple truth is that we are facing challenges together that no one in mankind ever be challenged before. Because some of the things we see here, because of the internet, it's a very young technology. We don't know the answer. And sometimes we have made mistakes. But we have to work together to actually try to figure out how to do this better. So we need people to engage. So we can avoid the mistakes we've done and do new mistakes instead. No one has created internet before. No one has created anything like the multi-stakeholder model before. No one has created anything like this event before. We're actually doing something for the first time. And I happen to think when you look back in 25, 50 years' time on this particular period in, in time, that they're going to look at this and see a really big revolution where we were able to together to create something that is so unique as we call the Internet. But we're not done. It's not a natural resource. It's something that has to be mended, fixed, and developed all the time. And I'm hoping that we can do that together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This uh, uh, was the last keynote speech, and we will now move to the uh, panel four. We will start with it a tad bit earlier. Uh, it will be uh, on, uh, in, uh, I have to look at it, international trade agreements and internet governance. And it will be moderated by William Drake from the University of Zurich. So William, if you would take the floor, and then please introduce the panelists yourself. I hope they are all here. Is, is Pierce here? Oh, oh okay, great. Um, hello, everybody. So, yes, I'm Bill Drake, and this is the, the closing plenary, and we're starting early? That sounds good. It's very unusual. Well, thank you, Joran, for your comments. It's very interesting. Um, so, uh, 
in the tradition of last year where we finished uh, Eurodig by talking about internet fragmentation, this time we're going to do something equally simple and talk about international trade agreements. I'm sure that all, all of you know that international trade is a very simple area to, to work in. It sort of makes ICANN look easy. Um, See if I can put my glasses on without disturbing this thing. So uh, the rules for international trade that are established under the World Trade Organization uh, were created before the internet took off. And so that has raised a lot of issues uh, for parties who have wanted to try to revise international trade arrangements to make them much more specific and related to the internet. And there's a great deal going on right now in that direction, um, there's a real push happening. And in fact, I would argue that uh, international trade, like uh, security, is probably one of the, the big drivers in the next few years of global internet governance. Um, the World Trade Organization's uh, agreements do have now binding international disciplines that are treaty disciplines, subject to compliance mechanisms, dispute resolution, so on, that apply to the internet. Um, and there have been years of work to try to make them more specific and focused uh, and relevant to the internet environment. But because a lot of that has not gone very well in terms of the bargaining dynamics in the World Trade Organization, much of the energy has gone into so-called preferential trade agreements, that's to say smaller group agreements, such as the famous uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which we've all come to know and love so much, uh, the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement between the EU and Canada, uh, both of which have very detailed language ab about uh, digital trade issues. Um, and now there are pending agreements, trade, the Trade and Services Agreement, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, the Regional Cooperation Economic uh, Partnership in Asia, uh, the redrafting of the North American Free Trade Agreement, all of which include, to varying degrees, uh, fairly detailed language about digital trade issues. Um, it's touched on issues such as data localization and cross-border data flows, privacy and data protection, intermediate, uh, intermediary liability, intellectual property, net neutrality, encryption, access to source code, you name it. There have been a lot of different provisions proposed in these different uh, discussions. Two weeks ago, the European Commission tabled a proposal on uh, enabling environments to facilitate online transactions that gets into consumer protection, spam, and ele electronic authentication, all in the context of international trade agreements. And they propose that the WTO take these up. Um, developing countries are not so excited about that. Um, all of which raises some questions. Procedurally, there's a question as to whether or not trade processes uh, are transparent enough, inclusive enough, participatory enough, from the standpoint of people who've worked in the multi-stakeholder internet governance environment um, to have the kind of uh, authority and legitimacy that one would want from global governance arrangements. There's also substantive questions. Which issues should be dealt with under an international trade framework? Which issues perhaps would you not want included under an international trade fr framework? And what role in particular has Europe played have European actors been influencing these developments? What policies should Europe be advocating? <clears throat> so these are all things we want to get into over the course of the next hour. And to do so, we have an excellent uh, panel of speakers that will go through essentially um, four parts. First, we'll start with a little discussion about the current European Commission work, uh, particularly with regard, I believe, to cross-border data flow. Uh, speaking for us uh, will be Pierce O'Donoghue, who's the Acting Director for Future Networks and DG Connect in the European Commission. And I understand you have to run to a, a flight fairly quickly, so we'll do you. Then we'll have Marilia uh, Maciel here from the Diplo Foundation. She's a senior uh, researcher there, and she'll give an overview of some of the issues that are on the table uh, in current trade discussions. And then we'll have a little discussion about how these developments are viewed from the standpoint of different European stakeholders. We have Robert Kropelski, Krop sorry, Kroplewski from the Polish government. Where are you, Robert? Uh, is he here? Ah, okay. Good to meet you. Erica Mann from uh, Covington and Burlington, former member of the board of directors of ICANN. 
Konstantinos Komatais from the Internet Society, and Herr Dr. Professor Wolfgang Klein-Victor, uh, formerly of the University of Aarhus. We will then go to open discussion with the audience for about 20, 25 minutes, including people uh, who are remote participants. Uh, and then we will wrap up and hand back to Sandra to do the closing ceremonies and so on. So that's our agenda. Let's start with Pierce then, if you, if you could come forward. And Pierce O'Donoghue from the European Commission. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Uh, the first thing I have to do is apologize to Bill because when Bill asked me to speak on this uh, platform, I first of all said no, uh, which is a bad way to start a conversation. But then somebody reminded me that uh, my flight was a bit later than I thought and the airport is not very far away. So that's a great opportunity for me and I do thank you for the opportunity to slot in at the start of your program because this is a very important issue. I was very happy this morning to speak about the next generation internet and our plans for that. And that's a theme that we've heard repeatedly today. Uh, I also said to somebody that I was very happy that this morning, for once, I didn't have to speak about free flow of data. But I'm going to speak about it now in the context that Bill has described. Because that is a, a, an issue that we are working on very actively at the moment in the European Union, in the Commission. It's also an area where we have to realize that before we seek to tell others at a global level what they should do with their data and with their data localization laws. In the European Union, we have to get our own house in order. And that is because we do have a number of restrictions on data. And also, we haven't had a full discussion as to why those restrictions exist and what it is exactly in the digital age that we are trying to achieve. Because we do have, as I said, a number of restrictions, but we also have underlying that quite a lot of legal uncertainty. It's not clear what is the situation at national level, but also what is the situation at European level. A lot of people are strongly aware now about our data protection laws, particularly the new General Data Protection Regulation, which sets a very high level. But that is actually the opportunity now for us, as I've said, to get our house in order to establish what is it that we need to achieve with regard to data in terms of its security, but also in terms of its circulation. So we are now in a situation where we have been talking about data protection, particularly for personal data, data security for all types of data, but let's think of commercial secret uh, data, which is not necessarily personal, versus the free flow of data, global trade, growing trade in services and services that depend on data, the internet and all of the e-commerce and other social and economic developments that have taken place. As Europe gets its house in order on data protection, where we are now clear where we stand, we are clear actually what is one of the core European values that dictates not only our internal policy, but how we relate to the rest of the world. In this case on trade, in relation to data, but also across a number of other issues. So now we can move to a situation in which we ourselves and then in consultation and discussion with our partners are talking more about data flows versus protectionism. And protectionism in this sense is for sometimes well-founded reasons but poorly executed and sometimes for pure good old-fashioned protectionism, we have entities, governments, regions who are not keen on having a lot of data flowing. They're floated data flowing out when that might in fact be perceived as an economic advantage if the data has to stay locally, the data servers, the data service providers and perhaps even the technologies will somehow also then gravitate to the same places where this data is being located. Now that's something which is more time than I can devote given the important discussion, but also something which we don't have to devote much time to because the risk of the protection of personal data being used as an excuse for protectionism, as an excuse to create blockages, or as an excuse to keep data locally for reasons of industrial espionage, or for uh, surveillance by intelligence, for intelligence gathering purposes, etc. They all exist, and we know that they do so. And that's why, as I've said, the European Union has now got its house in order, because we can go to partners and say, we really want to do business with you, but this is how we treat the data of individuals, personal data. 
We know that many others share the same values. They may not articulate it in exactly the same way, but nevertheless, let's talk, let's discuss. Let's see if our system meets your needs. Let's see if your system is adequate to meet our needs for protecting that data. And in any event, we have large, large amounts and a growing amount of non-personal data, which is becoming the lifeblood of so many industrial sectors. And we really want to be plugged in, and we want you to be plugged in to the world economy as it grows and develops. So we are launched into a process of, under the Data Economy Initiative, proposing in the autumn a measure with regard to the free flow of data, which we already asked our member states the question, why do you restrict data? It's largely because it comes from the paper era. The tax authority needed your tax data. Your tax data was in a file in the, in the filing cabinet in the basement, and that data needed to be handed over during a tax inspection. That data is now normally online. It is now electronic. In fact, more than half of the European Union member states tax authorities refuse paper. You have to submit your data electronically. So we're in a different world. Surely legislation and regulation should move on. No, what the member states need for what are legitimate public policy purposes is to have access to that data for regulatory scrutiny under very clear public policy mandates. Well, let's work on that then. Let's make sure that you can fulfill that mandate rather than storing the data and freezing up uh, taxation data, company law, company data, registration, documentation, which is actually blocking and chugging, uh, um, blocking the internal market in the European Union. Secondly, we have to require that certain data is subject to security. And there, again, it's digital. Uh, in one of the sessions which I had the privilege of listening to earlier on, it was, it was said very clearly that we know from the experts, and I'm sure some of you, the experts, are in the room, uh, storing data in your basement or on one server locally is not augmented security. It is actually the lowest level of security that you could possibly have. So again, let's identify security standards that certain critical sets of data need to be stored or processed under, but please again, don't think that localization is the answer. And that's exactly the sort of things that we will be putting into place with the European Union member states in the autumn. That allows us to go then to our partners, who are also very keen on this issue. At the moment, for example, at CBIT in March, the European Union announced with Japan that we are at the critical stage of negotiating a free trade agreement between Japan and the European Union. The Japanese authorities are very keen to have a chapter on data and data uh, circulation. They want to be plugged into the European Union market. So, what was announced in March was that we are now involved in what are formerly called adequacy negotiations to see if the data protection regulation and the way it is implemented in Japan gives the equivalent protection that we would expect of that data here in the European Union. And by the way, it's already looking forward to May of next year when the GDPR will be in force so that it will be future-proofed. There are a number of like-minded countries who want to engage in the same discussion. But what about those who are not necessarily like-minded? There's a lot of discussion at a multilateral level about what could be future trade negotiations. And there, we would expect the same for personal data. But then we find ourselves in some uncomfortable company on occasion, because some of the other countries would say, well, we too have a very high level of personal data protection. And it's cause for pause, because of what we think we know about some of those countries and jurisdictions would suggest that perhaps what we know already about protection of personal data is not actually the equivalent to what is in the European Union, but moreover that there may be other motives for having data of their citizens stored locally. So we have to be very careful at an international level. And now I will come to my concluding point, which is that while we internally within the European Union are discussing with members of the European Parliament, with the member states, as to how best in the future to ensure that digital trade supports our development agenda, that we are actually actively seeking to have free flow of, trade, of data with our trading partners to ensure that everybody is benefiting from the, from the developments of goods and services and technologies on the internet, we nevertheless have to ensure 
that we protect personal data, but more importantly, that we do not accept others for non-legitimate reasons to use data protection, for example, as an excuse to close the borders. And that is going to be a challenge in the future. And that is actually where, and I finish on this point, again, as I was saying this morning for other reasons, the multi-stakeholder model is important. Why? Because civil society, <coughs> activists, and those who are engaged in non-governmental organizations are an essential source of information and intelligence in the course of any discussion to understand just how is, tra is data treated elsewhere, just what would be the implications of a free flow of, a, a tra of data agreement with another particular country, but also what does happen to data which a partner may say they must store locally. So we wish to continue to discuss uh, in the institutions that exist, and I'm thinking particularly of the IGF, uh, in the future, these issues of data flows in order to ensure that what we do at European level is actually based on fact, it is realistic, and that it does not have unwanted and unforeseen negative consequences at a global level. But I leave you with the thought that once we can be sure that we are protecting personal data, it is for the good of all, it is for economic and social development worldwide, which we all have an obligation to support that we have the free flow of data at an international level and that we remove data localization requirements. I hope I haven't been too long. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Uh, you, would you like to stand here or sit? All right, sh should we have all the panelists come up then? Why don't we all come up? So, come on, Wolfgang, Robert, and where's Erica? There she is, okay. Hi. Sorry, I didn't know where. Wolfgang. <laughs> um, oh, I didn't realize. There's one more, okay. Then I will come and join you, Marillion. So, um, let's talk first. I, I don't know how familiar everybody is with some of the issues that are being discussed under the rubric of digital trade, um, but a lot of these have proven very controversial and very difficult. And uh, we had a session earlier uh, in this uh, meeting on Monday that Marillion participated in on data localization and barriers to cross-border data flow. That's certainly been one big issue, but there are other issues as well on the agenda. So I thought perhaps, Marilia, you could give a little overview from the work you've been doing uh, uh, about some of the issues that parties have introduced. Right. Thank you very much, Bill. Indeed, data localization is one of the issues that are, is the most mentioned when we are talking about the inclusion of digital policy issues in trade discussions or negotiations. But there are many more, as you have mentioned um, before, in trade agreements. We see the inclusion of intermediary liability in the TPP, um, which is still relevant, even though the US has backed down from the TPP. Provision of the, of the TPP are still being seen as a model that could influence, for instance, the process of renegotiation of NAFTA. So it's a model that is still relevant to us. Cryptography, source code, spam, they have all been included before in the TPP and also on the trade on, on services, uh, which has one of, as one of the negotiating parties, the European Union. But I wouldn't want to focus on trade agreements here for two reasons. One of them is because I think that in the internet governance spaces, because these processes have been uh, so um, lacking transparency, this has been the focus of discussions that we have had before in the IGF, in the Eurodig, and there is another pressing issue that probably requires uh, a more urgent discussion from our side too, which is the upcoming negotiations of the WTO uh, Ministerial on e-commerce. The WTO Ministerial will happen in the end of the year, in November, in Buenos Aires. Um, the WTO has a working program on electronic commerce that dates back from 98. 
um, some progress has been made, but not that much progress, and progress has been uneven uh, in different commissions in the WTO. Services has progressed more than goods, more than intellectual property, for example. But there is an increasing pressure to make progress with e-commerce in the WTO. Partly because negotiations in the WTO has been, have been stalled in different areas. Um, there is a pressure to show positive results. And also because e-commerce has provided some very good examples um, of promoting development in several developing countries, including uh, China, Brazil, Argentina. They all have champions in e-commerce e that have created some dynamism in the local national economy. So this is a topic that the WTO wants to discuss uh, very much. And the way that this is taking place is that member countries have put forward some non-papers. They call non-papers because they are non-binding. Um, these are exploratory papers in which countries have put forward their opinions on issues and topics that could be included in future trade negotiations, but it's not certain that they will be. Um, and which are the, these issues? One of them that is very important for member countries in the WTO is taxation. Since the work program on, the, on electronic commerce has been introduced, and there has been a moratorium on taxation on electronic transmissions. And this means that electronic transmissions, when they cross their border, they, are not, uh, uh, they do not go uh, under taxation over customs duties. Um, but the problem there is right now is that there is a discussion, should we extend uh, this moratorium, which has been renewed every two years, into something more permanent or not? Uh, the US, the European Union, Japan, they are very much in favor of extending and making this moratorium permanent, whereas other countries are questioning if this is, would be a good thing or not especially uh, because of the fact that there are many uh, products that were crossing the border before, such as music, such as books, that do not necessarily cross the border uh, anymore because they cross as electronic transmissions. Are these still goods? Are these services? There is some uh, lack of clarity, uh, whereas with regards to how to classify these digitized products, and that creates the uh, problems. Other issues that have been raised by some member countries is in the context of 3D printing and all the changes that 3D printing will bring, especially the association of 3D scanning and 3D printing, and how this will impact the flow of goods cross borders. So there is still uncertainty and lack of knowledge of how this is going to play out. So some countries prefer to extend the moratorium for a couple of years more and review the situation later. But not only taxation uh, is being discussed in the WTO, another very important point is uh, mark, uh, data flows and, and barriers to data flows that can uh, create a lot of problems that data flows underpin uh, e-commerce, especially the commerce of services after all. And in this point, there is a clear position from uh, the European Union, like we have heard from, from the Commission, um, from the US, from Japan, to try to make uh, measures such as data localization something that's, that, that is seen as not accepted uh, worldwide. Whereas there are countries that believe that data localization is not a good thing, but there are still rules in place that would prevent data localization. This has been, for instance, the position of the government of Brazil in the known paper that they have uh, put forward. Another topic um, that is very uh, hot in the WTO is trade uh, facilitation. And this is probably a good discussion to take place in the WTO. Not all the inclusions of topics in the trade agenda are necessarily bad. This is something that needs to take place. So for instance, uh, paperless trade, this is something that needs uh, to be more harmonized across countries. And what they call as single window, which is the opportunity that a country has to go to one single focal point in other country administration to fill all the paperwork or to do all the administrative procedures. Nowadays, uh, many times, if you are an e-commerce company, you need to go to different authorities in the countries that you want to sell to, uh, and the single window would make this process uh, much more uh, simple. Um, there is some topics, uh, there are some topics that are discussed that are very uh, relevant to internet governance communities as well. These topics, they have not been put forward by a large number of countries, but by a few of them. 
One of them is network neutrality. Brazil has tabled uh, in their known paper that network neutrality should be framed uh, as a trade issue and the adoption of a network neutrality principle would encourage competition and trade and facilitate trade. Technical standards is a topic that has been included uh, by uh, the US and European uh, Union, especially the need to foster interoperability as a way to encourage and strengthen competition. And the transference of technology is another important point, and here we have a clear division line um, between uh, countries that believe that trade agreements should not create requirements for tra technology transfer for companies, and countries like Brazil and other developing countries that believe that uh, technology transfer should be encouraged and not limited uh, in trade agreements. And of course, there are some points uh, related to regulatory frameworks that are also discussed. In this point, the WTO would not necessarily be the focal point of discussion, but the WTO wants to see more coordination with the participation of other international organizations and member states. These regulatory frameworks, they are uh, uh, most la mostly three. One of them is consumer protection. There is a lot of agreement that consumer protection needs to be more harmonized, uh, including on the level of enforcement. Uh, privacy is another uh, topic that is very important. Of course, in discussions on e-commerce, on the Council of Europe Convention 108 is seen as one of the very important um, frameworks, international frameworks of treaties that member countries should adhere to in order to foster harmonization. Um, and uh, cybercrime, which is another topic. There are several researches that point out the fact that the lock, lack of trust uh, is mostly due to problems related to uh, cybercrime and, and concerns related to identity uh, theft online and, and, and breaches to privacy. So these are some of the issues that are being discussed in the WTO. In the WTO. Like I mentioned, uh, the ministerial will happen in November, and I think it would be of interest um, to this community as well to see how issues are going to take place in the ministerial. Thank you very much. That was a very uh, quick and concise uh, summary of some very complex issues. Uh, I'd like that now to turn to our four uh, panelists who come from different stakeholder perspectives, I think, um, governmental and private sector and technical community, civil society, to uh, offer their thoughts in five minutes a pop, please, uh, about uh, both the procedural aspects of whether or not you think that the, the trade framework approach uh, needs any reform, et cetera, to make it more consistent with the kinds of things that we expect in the multi-stakeholder environment, uh, as well as the substantive issues and the positions taken by European uh, governments. So any of those points that any of you would like to get into, uh, it would be really great. We'll start with you, Robert. Thank you very much for voice and invitation to the Tallinn. Uh, I'm Pani Pushari uh, of Minister of Digitalization in, in Poland, uh, responsible for uh, information society and uh, called uh, to work on, in, in treaties. Yes. Uh, in our country, Poland, uh, we have internet and society and, and digital economy uh, 23 uh, years. This is rather like in the other countries. And because of that, uh, we have uh, our um, uh, experience. And like a new ministry, very young, because our ministry exists uh, above one year, yes, and was uh, created from the Ministry of Administration. And because of that, it, now it's Ministry of Digitalization, we can create a policy thinking uh, on digital way. And in one moment, uh, we uh, quickly recognize that uh, we need to start to look on not only digital single market in Europe, but globally to think about digital economy through uh, and above the, uh, the borders. Because of that, uh, we try to check the WTO, uh, like, like you invited me to talk about it, yes. And uh, the offers from, uh, from many countries. And in one moment, uh, we recognized that um, it is a very difficult way, but it's very um, important uh, to have an ambitious agenda for uh, Buenos Aires like that, for example. But of course, we, we had uh, also Oslo, we, we had a uh, June uh, discussion. Um, 
in the meantime, uh, was uh, 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 the Commission uh, um, carry a negotiation uh, with uh, Canada, of course, is TISA, TT, uh, in the, at that moment TTP, I, yeah, yeah, of course, now Turkey, yes, and uh, now it's of course the most important Japan. And uh, our country uh, uh, is uh, one of the 15 like-minded country about uh, data flows. And we think in that uh, treaty aspects and data flows um, uh, like a data personal data and unpersonal data. We think very, uh, very real about that data, uh, data came, came, in, uh, came in from machines. And maybe it, uh, it will be a little new, but uh, everyone here uh, know a famous mantra, data is uh, oil. It's, on my opinion, in our ministry, it's uh, uh, a little true because if we think about digital economy, uh, it's, it's worth to, uh, to see that data is an air, it's a nature, it's an environment. And every machine who observe the data need to share the, the data to others to make a, in, uh, innovations. Because we uh, also observed that uh, old innovations blocked uh, new innovations because of closed technology, closed uh, algorithms, and uh, patents, for example. And uh, it's, it's, it is very important to start this discussion how to open that legal instruments to uh, make a movement to make an uh, environment and make a uh, trust between countries and ecosystems, different countries, even China, for example, uh, to on, on uh, 2nd June was a submit in the Commission. And if we think about different countries and we think about uh, like a cooperation between, between uh, ecosystems and multi-stakeholder network, yes, we can um, build a new agenda, despite WTO will be not um, uh, fruitful, for example. Um, of course, in the same moment, we need to prepare the agenda, yes, we need, uh, that is a very good point, uh, a commerce level. A commerce level could create a trust, trust service, contract uh, acceptance, the signature, it's a very, it's a very normal and natural uh, analog word. It's not, it is not specific on the digital. The digitalization uh, give, give us the possibility to be unpresent between transactions, yes. Maybe uh, like that. Um, um, our uh, aim is to work on these tr treaties very, very openly because we believe that data for, pe for Poland, for example, yes, it's uh, error to make a growth and happiness of our um, citizens and, uh, and entrepreneurships. Thank you. Thank you very much in precisely five minutes. That's astonishing, so thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, let's turn next to Konstantinos Komatais from the Internet Society. Konstantinos. Thanks, Bill. Uh, hi, everyone. So. I think that one of the crucial questions we should ask ourselves is whether the internet governance community, whether we are ready to have discussions for trade. Um, and I think that if we were to ask this question five years ago, perhaps, the answer most probably would be no. However, right now, the world is very different, and uh, we have all come to realize that also trade discussions are very different. Substantively, in particular, uh, issues that affect the internet, whether we're talking about intellectual property rights or data protection or data localization for that matter or security are start popping up more and more uh, in trade agreements which inevitably make those agreements an issue of uh, internet governance. However, procedurally, it is a completely different issue. Trade agreements have historically been closed, uh, some would say even secretive, uh, the transparency was lacking, uh, there were accountability questions, and for a community, for this community, for the internet governance community that has fought so very hard to ensure that 
stakeholders, the multi-stakeholder model uh, is sustained and preserved, this is a very hard challenge. Um, and we have reached a stage as an internet community where we have stopped fighting and we should stop fighting about the multi-stakeholder model. It has been recognized, it is in, in many, many documents from the OECD, from uh, the UN, from uh, WISIS. Uh, this, these places like these are celebrating this very inclusion. Uh, and we should not fight again for the model just because it it happens in a different space that it's called trade. And this is simply because trade impacts the internet. Um, but it used to, I mean, the, and trade discussions always used to have a certain impact on the internet. Let's take taxation, for, for instance, that Marilia has spoken. We at the Internet Society are in the business, amongst many other things, of helping uh, various countries and communities setting up IXPs. Uh, those are the internet exchange points that ensure that the traffic runs locally, thus it creates much more efficiency, lowers the cost, etc., etc. One of the things that we see all the time is that because of trade barriers, and taxation in particular, the equipment that needs to get into the country gets stuck at customs. And it gets stuck for a long time, meaning that by the time that it is released, it is almost unusable. And that equipment is very expensive. Technical standards, again, this, it is very interesting and it's very good that these discussions are happening, but we also have to be very mindful of what we mean by technical standards and how those technical standards relate to the internet. What I mean by that is that the work, it is very important that the work of organizations like the Internet Engineering Task Force or the W3C, that are coming up with those very internet standards is not undermined. Those standards have for the past 30 years supported the internet and they operate under certain specific procedures that are not necessarily always understandable, I would say, by trade negotiators uh, or within the context of uh, trade. So, where are we now? Well, I think that Things are a little bit more complex given the current political climate that uh, exists. We hear uh, increasingly that uh, from various sides uh, that globalization is challenged. Uh, some protectionism policies are even uh, emerging uh, and approaches. And this creates challenges to the global internet, which by definition is supporting uh, globalization. So I think that it's more important than ever perhaps to A, make sure that the internet discussions, we accept that the internet discussions are part of trade and we become part of these discussions. We find a way, not necessarily to be at the negotiating table, but we find a way to demand the transparency. We find a way to demand that the text is released to everyone at an equal pace, not to certain groups and we find a way to make our voice heard and influence those discussions. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Konstantinos. Um, so, okay. Uh, we turn next to Erica for another view. Erica. Thank you so much. Um, when Bill asked me about two weeks ago, or maybe a little bit longer, uh, what I think about the idea to have the multi-stakeholder model infused into trade environments, and in particular digital trade and uh, data flow. I was a bit skeptical, um, and it took me a while to evaluate my own history and knowledge about the, trading and, uh, the trade environment. I was a member of the European Parliament 50 years and covered trade, was a speaker on trade, so I negotiated for, on behalf of the Trade Committee in the Parliament um, many, um, many existing uh, arrangements. It's a complex environment, but I think there is something interesting about this idea. And thinking about it more and more, I like it even more. And let me tell you why. So first reason, there is an in, um, immense pressure actually to do something in the digital trade environment, either in relation to e-commerce, or um, uh, data flow is one of the, the more uh, latest kids on the block. Um, so there are many reasons why, and it becomes even more important because many member states and many states globally are searching for solutions. 
And these solutions you need to find independently if you want to have a total open uh, internet bo um, trading environment or if you want to have some protection and uh, data localization. In both cases, you need to find a solution. But the second uh, side, I think it's important to think about it in a way that this uh, multi-stakeholder model is flexible, sufficient flexible, and can deal with quite complex environments. Um, so it is maybe a good way of testing it. And I would say not in the sense in becoming suddenly a partner in all trade issues. Um, this is too much. Um, but maybe focusing on few uh, areas which uh, relate to the internet, to the digital internet environment, in particular data flow. It's a young, it's very young. Uh, governments are searching for solutions. So it is an, uh, it is an easy way uh, to become a partner in this discussion. Secondly, I think it is, nothing is running away in the moment. Um, the World Trade Organization is not suddenly moving fast. It's not moving fast since years, uh, at least not on the, um, on the global level. So I, there is no, no hurry. Um, the, bi uh, the bilateral trade agreements are a little bit different, and there we have at least seen in the EU-Korea agreement already a text in introduced uh, with regard to financial services and um, uh, data flow. So there are some examples uh, which already exist, and of course there are examples on working group level, like the e-commerce level on, um, on data flow. They are all very soft, but in anyhow, they indicate that there's a need to understand this environment better. So I would recommend really to focus on this environment and maybe not even to go and try to capture all topics. Taxation, it's such a complex environment. I'm not sure if we would want to go into the, um, would want to start even working on a taxation environment. Um, but data flow, my recommendation would be definitely to pick this up and to test it. And I think governments would be more than willing uh, to listen to us. Well, thank you very much, since that's what I'm busy running around advocating. I'm very happy with that. <laughs> so, okay, uh, Wolfgang. Yeah, the beauty of the internet is that everybody can communicate with everybody. And we have heard from Gerland, we have now 4 billion users. So that means we have, if you multiply 4 billion with 4 billion, then you know the options we have for uh, uh, bilateral communications. The problem comes that also all internet related public policy issues are also interconnected. And what I see is that uh, one of the weaknesses of the um, systems and mechanisms we have today is that while everything is connected with everything, issues are negotiated in silos. So uh, last week in the same place here in the same hotel, there was a conference of the NATO uh, Coordination Center for Cybersecurity. And, you know, this uh, military people discussing the same issue, but from a totally different perspective, and they come also to different conclusions, but certainly decisions made in the cybersecurity field affect the digital economy, and they affect human rights. Uh, people in the digital economy, like the G20 ministers for the digital economy, they had their own meeting in Düsseldorf in April. This is a totally different crowd. They, including the trade people, uh, as we have seen, they have for years and their meetings and their cultures and their traditions, but decisions they made have consequences for security and they affect also human rights. And I think here in, 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 in our more or less human rights-based environment, the internet governance people are very uh, close to engagement of, uh, um, uh, in support for human rights, privacy, freedom of expression, freedom of association. So we are also a little bit disconnected from these people who are discussing security and trade. And the way forward, what I see is really to pull them out of the silos and to create more and better uh, communication among them. And this uh, goes, uh, you know, more deeper into the multi-stakeholder model. But the multi-stakeholder model is not one model, and I can only echo what Konstantin and Erika has said. If we try to uh, be more elaborative on the multi-stakeholder model, we have to accept that the Internet is also a layered system. And on different layers, you can have different practices. 
We had a senseless discussion for years whether the multilateralism dies because we have the multi-stakeholderism. Uh, this is nonsense. The multilateral treaty system will not disappear. But it's embedded now in a broader environment where all stakeholders have a say. Certainly, the final negotiations where it comes to legally binding treaties has to be done by groups and uh, persons who have a legitimacy <laughs> to negotiate this, and this will be governments. But it would be totally stupid if governments would not, before they enter the negotiation room, enter into a broad multi-stakeholder discussion to get the various arguments from the other groups on board. That means this would enhance their capability uh, to come to uh, negotiation results which are also sustainable. If they ignore the voices of the public, then the consequence is you have thousands or millions of people in the streets protesting against the outcome. And that is not in the interest of anyone. So it, it's in the self-interest of government that they keep their role to negotiate, probably also in a closed environment, but to open eyes and ears before they uh, go to the negotiation room. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. So, okay, we, we have uh, a good half hour uh, for open discussion with uh, everybody in the room who would like to get involved, as well as any remote participants. I want to recognize back here Aaron Jel Bojanovic from ISAC Serbia. He's our remote participation person. And if anybody uh, online has something that they want to interject, just flag me and uh, we'll call on you to make that happen as well. But in the meanwhile, of course, for the people in the room, uh, I think uh, this is a, a good opportunity uh, to try to synthesize by, by contemplating uh, some of the points that were made by the panelists I think are really important. We can't have a completely unrealistic understanding of how international trade is gonna work. The trade community is deeply institutionalized. It's extraordinarily complex. The processes they follow are not ones that most of us are familiar. I, I've been doing trade for 30 years, but, but mo most people don't really follow this stuff. And so when you, you do try to interject yourself, uh, unless you do it in a truly informed way, you're gonna get a backlash from these people that it's not useful. At the same time, they are functioning in a void. You've got people sitting around, not just in the WTO, but in a lot of trade environments, trying to make decisions about very complex issues related to internet encryption and so on that they really don't even have the tool sets to work on directly. Uh, so there has to be a way where the global internet community broadly defined can, through some parallel kind of activity, provide an input, provide a, advice, discuss some of these issues in a way that will be useful to the trade community. So I hope that we can try and think about how to begin this evolution going forward because these trade issues are not going away. It's, as I said at the outset, it's like security. Trade is gonna be a big thing in the coming years. Uh, there's a huge push coming from all over the world, from a lot of governments and companies. And so we're gonna have to engage this space. So I now see that I've got a couple of people uh, waiting in the line, so that's fantastic. So let's, uh, let's start uh, with the gentleman here. And uh, please just get in line behind the the microphones, and when you speak, uh, say who you are, and please try to limit yourself to a reasonable you know, minute or two. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Elke Bals, and I come from uh, the Netherlands. Um, and this year, I was part of the pre-event of Jordic regarding copyright. Um, and my question to you as a panel is, um, how could copyright issues be solved um, with an um, WTO or some other agre um, agreement, because like Wolfgang just said, the internet is now, uh, it's, it's one network, but it's divided in silos, but also in the movie industry, the contracts are based on um, countries itself. But how can we make um, or open up these silos for, for instance, the movie industry? Thank you. Copyright has been one of the most divisive issues from the standpoint of internet people uh, when looking at trade agreements. Uh, who would like to take this up? Marillion? Uh, Madame? Go ahead. 
I mean, it's maybe one of the most difficult issues. First of all, it's an old one. It's not new. So data flow is nice and beautiful because it's, it's a relatively young issue. Um, so the uh, intellectual property rights, it's a standing item in uh, World Trade Organization since the beginning. It's part of all of the agreements, the bilateral the, um, and the multilateral. And there is always a conflict. You always have a conflict between, in particular, the recent years, between the more established um, industry, which needs more traditional IP protections, and the ones which have their models more based on what is either called in the American environment fair, fair use exemptions or in the um, European exemption and limitations, which practically allow uh, for individual use um, a more liberal use of, um, of work. Um, and this um, is not solved. And I think it will continue. I don't see a quick solution. It might shift over, over years since more internet models are becoming more business driven as well. Take for example the, um, the TV industry, um, uh, the movie industry with Netflix. So there are suddenly business, workable business models. At the time it was difficult because there were no real workable uh, business models. So it might just fade away one day because they're workable business models and then suddenly um, the topic becomes less political. Um, but I think otherwise it will stay. I can't see it fading away or being solved. I'm not even sure if I would recommend it becomes part of our, it, it shall become part of our discussion, but maybe less in the sense that we believe we can offer solutions. Uh, but I'm just guessing a little bit what we could do in this environment. It's getting written into all the trade agreements though. It is um, Very quickly, I had a chance to follow discussions in the World Intellectual Property Organization for some years and I think that one of the things that is based on the way that we conceive intellectual property is that there is a mindset that more protection is always better. And although the digital development questions this because we have so many different models of revenues that are not necessarily based on intellectual property and more protection. This has not percolated into international organizations um, at all. But one of the things that are important that I think that we should do is to expose the different positions that countries take. Because if you go to WIPO, for instance, you see that the delegations are percolated by lobbies from uh, publishing houses, uh, pharmaceutical industries, and many times uh, the same countries take a completely different position elsewhere, including in internet governance spaces. So if we build more bridges with the access to knowledge movement, for instance, we can expose these positions and to try to see, okay, what are you defending after all? So this thing is something that we need to do as a homework because there has not been enough discussion on access to knowledge, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, only quick, if I can add something. Maybe we start the union, digital union, the, that multi-stakeholder. Uh, agreement from the data. It's, it's rather easier than from the uh, IP size because data is a not unique thing. It's a data. Yeah. After algorithms, it's a unique and th that is a, a level of protection, but not before. And maybe we slowly can uh, develop the road to the interoperability for open standards and to, to, um, to able uh, talking of machines, yes, like that, for example. Thank you. We have somebody here who's actually spent years studying this problem. So yes, perhaps you could. Very briefly, I don't think we should really underestimate what this community has done in terms of the IPR. I mean, yeah. think of 15 years ago, even within trade, I mean, think of 15 years ago, it was a no-go, right? Right now, yes, there, are a lot of, there is a lot of IPR discussion within trade, and I totally agree with Erica, you know, this should not be the starting point. But we, and by we, I mean this, the internet community has really managed to open up a lot of these discussions, uh, has managed to express its concerns, its support, uh, its voice in this discussion, in these discussions, and it has managed to an extent to influence these discussions. Now, the IPR, as Marilia said, is taking place in way too many places. So, and because it's taking place in so many different places, it is also very important that we 
pick and choose. At some point, I predicted that the same thing would happen as Erica. As, new, as more and more business models emerge, uh, they will become, and they're successful, they will actually become part of a completely different discussion than it currently is. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman over here, please. Could you, could you speak up, please, and say who you are? Okay, I think you have a mic problem. One second, please. My name is Ian Fish. Uh, I'm from BCS, the Chartered Institute of IT in London. And uh, my question has partly been answered already when you were talking about APR, but uh, it's actually more general. And it starts from Wolfgang's uh, assertion about uh, the multi-stakeholder model. Um, and it sounded to me as if the multi-stakeholder model for internet governance doesn't necessarily include all the people that are really needed for internet governance. And this may have an impact on trade negotiations. I just wanted to uh, hear from the panel what they thought of that and whether it would. Wolfgang? Could we begin these questions? Uh, again, you know, the, uh, if you look back 15 years ago, the multi-stakeholder model was not really um, a discussion point because it was just invented. And there was a lot of doubts, you know, whether this will work or not. Now, after 15 years, this model is seen as a helpful instrument to settle some questions, not all, all questions. And I always say we are in the early days, so we have not yet too many, uh, let's say, concrete outcomes from the process. What we have in ICANN is really a demonstrated uh, success uh, which uh, has created a so-called empowered community. But this empowered community has still to be stress tested whether it works. So we have in the uh, Sao Paulo conference, we have a demonstrated success that the community can come together and to draft a text of principles. Uh, the Sao Paulo declaration on f uh, fundamental principles for internet governance is probably the best document we have so far as a reference document for, uh, for internet governance. So, but uh, for other issues, it remains to be seen how this can be developed. I think Bertrand and Bill and others have argued since the uh, days of the World Summit on the Information Society that each issue needs a special solution, one size fits all doesn't work, so that means you have to build the solution around the issue. And there are some issues where you have different responsibilities and different roles for the stakeholders. So, and in, again, probably trade, cybersecurity for the military, these are issues where the governments have to have a place where they are sitting alone. But other issues, uh, you know, probably governments should be more in an advisory role as it's with domain names. So, and, but the general principle is, and I can only repeat what I said in my first intervention, is it is wise for all stakeholders before they enter into a decision-making phase to consult with the other stakeholders so that they understand the arguments better and take this on board if they uh, try to find the final consensus. I don't know whether this exactly uh, uh, answers the question. I, I think that um, he was particularly interested in the question of inclusivity. Um, would anybody else uh, want to get on that particular issue, or, or shall I move on? Uh, just briefly? Huh? Whether the pro we have the, all the right people engaged in multi-stakeholder process for this. I mean, what I like about this idea, I haven't thought about it much more than at the beginning, um, is that this is maybe an organized group, well organized, tested uh, over many, many years, uh, produced, like um, Wolfgang said, already outcome. Um, it is maybe the only global group in, um, in, the, in the internet environment who could become uh, influential and could actually do this. I, I would say if we uh, stay modest and not suddenly become 
we can do everything. I don't think so we can do everything. We have to be modest and take it step by step. But on data flow, I, I think we can do it. And there is a, there's a vacuum, there's something needed because nothing organized exists, which is broad <coughs> enough like a multi-stakeholder um, environment like ours. All the others are not organized. It's either, you know, particular interest from certain NGOs or business, that's all good, but it's not uh, defined as a community. So there might be a role for us to play. Very briefly, in terms of inclusiveness, I think you, you have a, a point, and you raise a, a very valid point. Having said that, however, there is also an increasing now demand from people to participate. So we see more and more people from Africa because they're entering the internet space and they're getting connected, and they say, I want to be part of this conversation. I, I, I demand to be part of this conversation. We see that discussions up, you know, up until recently, it was only English. Now discussions are taking place in other languages as well. Uh, we see bodies like the Internet Engineering Task Force, which only used to have meetings in the Western Hemisphere, to actually, sorry, yes, to actually hold meetings in South America. So we see that, yes, inclusiveness will always be a, ch a challenge, but as more people are getting online, and as the next four billion are getting online, I think that we will see much less of that issue. Thank you. Annette has been waiting patiently over here on the left, and I note that Luca has improved the feng shui by moving to the right, so we, we have balance, that's great. So, Annette, please. All right. Annette Mühlberg, I'm a member of the European uh, Internet User Organization of ICANN Eurelo, and I'm also a member of the trade union Verdi. Um, I have three questions. First is, how do you define personal data? Is it, personal, uh, is it data that can be related to a person? Second question, how do you make sure that the multi-stakeholder model really um, works? That those who do not earn money with data flow have enough resources to write studies in respect to human rights, etc because this is the crucial point about the multi-stakeholder model. If you have a multi-stakeholder where you have uh, uh, 10 people, just uh, as an example, who have loads of money who can ask 1,000 people to write uh, nice studies and they have uh, 1,000 users, but they have no money at all, so this is a problem. So um, does the EU Commission give that money? Just a question. And third question, how much time do we really have? Is it November this year? Okay, <laughs> three juicy questions. Who'd like to start with the intermingling of personal and non-personal data and the definitional problems thereof? Would you, uh, Erica? I, I can take the first one. The, the way I would see it is the following, at least for the European Union. I mean, you have to do this um, country by country. It will be not identical. So for the European Union, we have a framework, a general framework on uh, regulation uh, on personal data. This is the basis. And um, this is not something which is going to be negotiable. But this is not what is going to happen in the, in the trade environment. But what is negotiated is to ensure that data can flow, uh, flow freely. Now, you, you buy something in another country, you want to ensure that what you buy, you receive. And if you buy it in, uh, from, um, from somebody in, um, in another country, which is not part of the European Union, you still want to receive it. There are different ways of ensuring this. When you take, for example, the uh, European Union and the United States, but similar agreement exists with other countries where personal data needs to be transferred, there are what is called, um, um, in the past, it, uh, the name was Safe Harbor Agreement, which ensures that the practice in different countries are accepted by the other countries. It's always tricky, it's never easy, but you have to do it, because otherwise you will have no e-commerce, no global e-commerce. Let's be clear, you will not have it. So we, the, the way I would see it, not to go into the discussion about um, personal data, but really to focus more how to ensure that e-commerce is ensured and what is an environment, uh, environment therefore, to ensure it is safe and uh, it is protected in case data is involved. And how to handle the safe and the protected, um, countries have good experience already 
It's never easy, um, I said before, but countries do have experience how to negotiate this. I don't know if just, somebody else wants to. You, you have a follow-up question on this one? I just want to but amplify something. We can do it bilaterally, otherwise. I, don't, I want to amplify something about her question, though. You know, One of the challenges has been for the European Union and for others in trying to define approaches here is that personal data and non-personal data are increasingly so interwoven, so intermeshed in so many different types of transactions that, that if they're mixed. So that, you know, your, your data is all over the world in different servers all the time. And, you know, any kind of transaction that you may be engaged in or that entities may be engaged in, there may be bits of ide personally identifiable information linked in there. And so then the question becomes, can an approach that is, that is based on uh, the, the, the data subject should be able to know and give permission and so on, how do we make that work in that kind of environment? It's a difficult question. It is a very difficult question, but I mean, it's not like we are starting fresh. We are already having an e-commerce environment. It's not uh, like we are suddenly inventing the internet or we are inventing how to buy a product online. We are doing this um, and there are different ways of doing it. And, and um, industry has different answers to these complicated questions. If they, if they send you a product, um, typically it is already in, in, the, in the country where you are located. At least if it's um, um, the biggest, the bigger uh, retailers are doing this. So it's not like they're not close to your country or inside your country. It's different if it's a digital product. So there are different ways of uh, doing it. My, my only advice would be, um, we have examples. We have e even examples in the complicated area of personal data, where the Europe, at least the European Union uh, negotiated uh, with different countries uh, agreements, how the both sides come to a standard agreement that both sides can ensure standards are high and data can be exchanged. And built on this, I think we can uh, build global models. Okay, uh, just briefly, and then we will move, because she had two other questions, and I have Lucas standing over there. Briefly, because if we look at, look at for uh, samples, the samples is coming. This uh, a United Kingdom with Brexit, because the United Kingdom is after implementation of the law, European law, and after Brexit, this is a question that uh, if the, that law will exist or not, and what about adequacy decision, or what about the partnership agreement, uh, who can um, prepare the rules yeah, of that, of personal data, I think. Okay, who would like to take care, uh, quickly the money question? Her second question? Well, that was the first one. Was The first one was privacy, second was money, and then the third, I've already left time. So just very quickly on the issue of, uh, I think you're referring to the issue of capture, if I, if I understand this correctly, right? Uh, so I think that the, the answer to the issue of capture can only come from the stakeholders participating in the process. There will always be an issue of, culture, of capture, whether you are talking about the multi-stakeholder model or any other model. Uh, but the, the, so participation means raising up and identifying the, the capture that is happening. And I think that all of us uh, have seen it or have seen the potential of it happening in various spaces and it can't be stopped. It's not easy and it doesn't come with the magic solution, but stakeholder, when we say the multi-stakeholder model, we just do not say just show up there and, you know, be and sit at the table. It means meaningful participation and meaningful participation means actually with making those very hard um, choices of speaking up when you see this capture happening. And on time, there's every different negotiation setting is on a different time frame. So what happens in the WTO ministerial in December is one thing, but then TISA, NAFTA, uh, everybody, they're all working in different time frames. None of these issues is going to go away. And I mean, they're going to be, they're going to be increasingly dominant in the years ahead. So it never hurts to get started sooner than later. Um, Luca, you've been waiting very patiently. I'm sorry. 
Go Thank ahead. you. Luca Belle, I work for the Center for Technology Green Society at FGV. I had a, a comment, or a comment and a question regarding uh, negotiation taking place within trade institutions such, such as the WTO. And my observation, my initial observation at the very beginning when I started reading about what negotiation were uh, actually considering is that many of the issues that have been debated have already been regulated at the national level. Uh, data protection and neutrality, interoperability, intellectual property rights. And so skeptics may think that the same issues being reproposed in venues that are very distant from democratic accountability may be a strategy to overrule what has already been decided through democratic uh, participation. Uh, and the second observation is that there are many governments that are very constructively uh, participating uh, and have been participating over the past uh, decade to multi-stakeholder venues, uh, promoting multi-stakeholderism, uh, transparency, inclusivity, openness, and so my question is, uh, in your experience, have you noticed any of those governments de facto promoting within trade negotiation more openness, uh, the, the, in, the inclusion of, cons for instance, open consultation, which is something that is, uh, ne has never, never been experimented uh, within trade negotiation. So those government that within the multi-stakeholder multi uh, venues that we uh, use to, uh, to attend promote multi-stakeholder reason. Do they also promote it when they have to negotiate trade policy? I would love to answer this, but I don't want to preempt my panelists. So. <laughs> Thank you for... Uh, that was a question about sample. Uh, very good question. Uh, if we can observe the environment uh, around the world, we have a very, very serious sample, China. And actual relation between European Union and China, European Union and G20, for example, and other side, the, the Trans-Pacific uh, Agreement, Japan, China also, New Zealand, Australia, yes, Indonesia, like that. We uh, previously uh, had a United States, now not. This is a very big question, yes? Because uh, United States uh, actually resigned to negotiate the TTP uh, Act, yeah? But this is that, for example. Uh, we have uh, countries, D5, around the world, yes? Uh, D9 in, the, in the Europe. Uh, Nor Nordic uh, Digital also. Uh, Poland, we, we are inside, yes, for example. <laughs> But we are we are a part of the European Union. This is a, this is a one uh, yes, a member of multi-stakeholder agreement. Um, just a quick comment. I think it's a very good question. Why these issues keep popping up on the international level? I think that they they are there for different reasons. Some of them, it's a requirement of harmonization of different approaches. So on privacy, for instance, as I mentioned in the beginning, there is a big promotion of more countries of the WTO to sign a Convention 108 so they have a common framework of discussion. So harmonization is a concern. There are other reasons that are related to, for instance, something that is still a moving target, such as encryption. So the contribution of the US is interesting, for instance, because they mentioned that encryption is important uh, to guarantee privacy. At the same time, encryption should be seen in the light of guaranteeing law enforcement the possibility to conduct their work. So the interpretation of encryption internationally is still a moving target, and I think that it has been advanced there to create another platform for discussion of encryption, for instance. So I think that different topics have different reasons, and there are issues that are more purely related to trade, such as a single uh, window or taxation that makes sense to be taken there. So different uh, agenda items have different logics to have been included in the agenda. But I think that one important um, topic is that Diplo Foundation promoted a course on digital commerce, aiming at opening a channel of discussions with negotiators that are going to be at the ministerial to discuss issues that 
have a digital background, if someone is going to sit on the table to discuss network neutrality, for instance, or encryption, it's important to understand the technical aspects of it, and also all the background and history of discussion that these topics have on digital policy and inter -governance, internet governance landscapes. And one of the things that we realized from the course is there is a very high level of openness to discuss these issues with other actors. There is a very high level of interest to understand how the the EATF or the Internet Society work on the development of standards, they do ask a lot of questions. And one opportunity to engage in the debate with them, and this is my last point, is the WTO Public Forum that is going to uh, happen soon. Uh, it is a moment in the WTO in which any stakeholder can make propositions of workshops. It is open for anyone to participate. The deadline to propose workshops to the WTO Public Forum is the 18th of June. So if you want to propose discussions, including on the issues that you raised, Luke, I think that is a good opportunity to do it. It is an open space of discussion. We've reached the witching hour, so I think we need to wrap this up. Uh, I, I just want to make one very quick response to that, uh, Luca. That is that both at the national level, there are consultations, and we need internet participants to get engaged there, particularly in the industrialized uh, world, um, but I think increasingly in other countries as well. And secondly, what it's about is trying to establish criteria by which those existing policies do not become used uh, as uh, hidden trade barriers and become more restrictive than is necessary to achieve the legitimate public interest. So that's the, that's the sort of approach that's being taken. Anyway, we've only scratched the surface here. It's a huge area. I've got two and a half minutes, but I've got all the organizers waving at me and saying stop. So, so I, I'm going to follow what the organizers are telling me. Okay. Um, so I'm sorry. We can discuss offline afterwards, but I believe I'm supposed to stop. So thank you very much, all. It's a big, complex area, and obviously there's much more to be said about it. And we will do that later, but not right now. Thank so thanks. thanks. Well done, One second, please hold. So, thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this concludes the final panel, and we will uh, have a short wrap up. Uh, uh, on stage here as well. Uh, uh, I would like to invite to the stage the Secretary General of Euroleague, Sandra Hofferichter, and also <laughs> the President of the Euroleague As Association. Where are you? Oh, perfect. <laughs> I didn't see you, sorry. <laughs> My bad. Uh, and uh, before I... Before I uh, uh, ha uh, Thomas Schneider, I would also like on the floor, please. Ambassador. He comes later. <laughs> uh, but before I give you the floor, I would like to personally thank, on behalf of the government of Estonia, the 568 people who took badges from the registration desk over the course of the past three days, and everyone who participated remotely. Without all of you uh, engaging in this dialogue, it would not have been possible, and, and we are very grateful, and I take about you. Thank you. Sandra. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we would really like to do a short wrap up and would appreciate if uh, you could stay in the room because this is actually the moment to give kudos to those who were behind this uh, organizing of the conference. But two sm small uh, agenda items we have still left. First is we would like to ask the young people who prepared in two pre-events, Copy Fighter and u Stick, to come on stage and uh, present the messages from, from their preparation work. Uh, Bernard, if you would like to start with uh, the program Copy Fighters. Thank you very much. So for the, 
for those of you who haven't no noticed it yet, um, we have spent uh, the three days before this conference uh, with 25 amazing young people who have been working on the topic of copyright and um, developed from the start where they um, thought about what actually the problems are that they experience in their daily lives um, towards a um, strong position on a, a range of matters, um, including uh, territoriality. Um, we, we want the European Union to take the lead in um, making the copyright legislation uh, um, compatible to the internet and we think that this only works if we abolish territoriality. Um, therefore we call on the European Union um, to uh, introduce a single uh, European copyright title. Uh, we have spoken about fair use. We think it is deeply necessary that we have um, harmonized rules for fair use. Um, <laughs> uh, um, especially in the European Union, but also um, in, in other parts of the world, um, to enable everyday um, usage of the internet and um, youth culture in general. Um, there are further points um, that we would like to discuss. Um, some of them are fairly specific. You can find out more on copyfighters.eu, where, uh, where we are presenting our position paper. And uh, once again, I would like to thank our participants, but also um, the organizers of Eurodig for um, yeah, enabling us to be here, and um, the other stakeholders involved in all of this, um, that we had the chance to interact with you. Um, and we would like to keep up this discussion um, and um, make sure that young people are seriously heard, not only here, but also in other forms of governance, um, where it is often a problem um, for young people to first get the foothold, and second of all, then also be taken seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Bella. And then Daniel Vauk, you were a participant in the Youth Stick. It was actually a um, follow-up event from the youth events we had in the previous year. We just changed the name a little bit and aligned the program a little bit more to the Eurodic agenda. So they were discussing all the categories which were also subject to discussion over the last two days. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so what the idea behind Youth Stick is, is what happens if you get young people who are leaders in their own fields into a room, into a basement for two days solid. What you get is core messages that are practical, solutions-based, and ambitious. And I think that's what we need young people involved is the ambition. That we're not afraid to go a little bit further, we're not afraid to step out of the comfort zone, and we're willing to have the very frank discussions and come up with solutions. So from this, we came up with 10 messages. Uh, you can find them all on the wiki. Uh, there's a section for the use stake. It has the messages there. So rather than read them all out word for word, I can kind of just maybe neatly sum up what we discussed. In terms of media and content, we discussed quite heavily about fake news. We discussed how to tackle fake news, how to educate people around fake news, and the idea of that people should have the right to publish content as long as it's not illegal. We discussed human rights uh, qu quite in length. We discussed the idea that access to the internet is not un universally recognized as a human right and that should be fixed. We believe that net neutrality shouldn't be driven by economics, and we also believe that content, content takedown and lack of transparency is quite a big issue for young people around human rights. We also believe that there needs to be a bit more done around connecting offline rights with online rights to show that they're very linked. We also discussed uh, a lot about cybersecurity. We talked a little bit about uh, all stakeholders to collaborate a bit more on the likes of uh, critical internet infrastructure, um, with emerging technology, there needs to be a bit more done in security to make sure that our futures are secure as we move into the likes of Internet of Things. Child safety was part of the discussion around more work done between law enforcement, government, and all stakeholders to make sure children aren't exploited online. We discussed then the idea that not just educators in government, but parents, schools, and educators should do more about cyberbullying and bullying online. And finally, we discussed very, very neatly uh, the idea of data security. That we believe as young people that we want our personal data to be secure and protected and not to be in the hands of anyone else. So I just want to kind of wrap up by saying that uh, I think everyone who took part in, in the youth stake was exceptional. Uh, they've inspired me and I, I'm sure they've probably inspired most of you because you've seen me quite active in sessions, in organizing sessions, in moderating sessions, even putting one together around sustainability. 
So young people are, again, we're ambitious. Uh, we're, we like talking about internet governance. And I'd like to thank Yuri Dig and the organizers, especially Tatiana and Katya, for helping us along the way and empowering us. And never forget that the youth voice is probably one of the most important voices in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'm actually only on this panel uh, for the gender balance because we need to avoid that white, old, hair, uh, old white haired men are always underrepresented in, in this panel. So this is why I'm here. And the only thing that makes sense is, as I have already spoken in the beginning uh, yesterday about the global IGF that is uh, going to come up uh, in Geneva, where you will have uh, much nicer weather than, than here in this uh, place, in, in the north of Europe, um, to hand over or ask our dear friend Cengetai from the uh, IGF Secretariat on stage to quickly give you a, a 50 uh, minute presentation about uh, the IGF in Geneva. Thank you, Cengetai. <laughs> First of all, uh, first of all, I thought you said uh, 30 minutes, right? Okay, okay, but not below 25. Ah, okay, okay, right. <laughs> no, uh, thank you very much. I'll just be very, very quick. I've got a speech that was written here, so I have to say it. So I'll be, I'll try to make it as quick as possible. Um, but it was really great. I mean, I really enjoyed it. As as usual, the juridics are very, very um, good. Okay, on. Um, Okay, um, on behalf of the United Nations uh, Secretary of the Internet Governance Forum, I would like to express my sincere gratitude, it's very UNE, <laughs> gratitude for inviting me and of course to congratulate Sandra Wolf and the rest of the Eurodig organizing team and the host country for an impressively organized meeting as always. For years, Eurodig has served as an effective platform where the European internet community addresses issues of their concern regarding internet governance. This year's forum provides with a very rich and diverse agenda on which the multi-stakeholder community offered many new perspectives. Some of these will make valuable inputs to many of the internet expert communities for further work. But what I find as one of the most valuable achievements of Eurodig is that over the years it has managed to establish a firm engagement of the broader community that was clearly visible here in Tallinn for the past two days. It was impressive to see how the stakeholders coming from the various countries and organizations with different backgrounds from across Europe debated and challenged many of the contemporary issues. The sense of the community that this multi-stakeholder forum has created is what is encouraging and, long, and the long-term promise for creating a better and safer internet for all. Only by enthusiastically working together, by committing to a better understanding of each other's perspectives, by learning one from one and from each other's, can we make a change. That is the core IGF objective, and Eurodig is very important partner on this path along with many of the existing national and regional IGFs. In these times, when the nations committed to, to, to strive towards achieving the sustainable development goals, our collaboration has never been more important, as many of the goals directly depend on people being connected to the internet, having good policies, robust ICTs, all in order to achieve social and economic uh, progress for the society. I am very pleased that the Eurodig community has been discussing some of the currently most important internet governance issues for all the citizens. At the same time, I would like to especially thank you for putting huge efforts into the youth present, informed and trained and engaged through dedicated pre-events as young people are and soon will be the new generation of experts and leaders in this field. I'm hoping that many of you will bring your knowledge and expertise to the global IGF, and you are all cordially invited to the 12th annual meeting of the IGF that will be hosted by the government of Switzerland at the premises of the United Nations offices in Geneva from 18 to 21st of December under the overarching theme, Shape Your Digital Future. 
The preparatory process is underway and we will be thankful if you would bring some of this wonderful energy that I can feel everywhere at this meeting into the intercessional work of the global IGF. With this, I thank you for, an excellent, for, for all your excellent and important work and wishing you many more meetings like this to come. And I think I'll see you in Georgia next year, right? Right, thank you very much. And sorry for the long speech. <laughs> Okay, and now we are close to be uh, at the end of our 10th Eurodig, but not without thanking those who, who really worked hard to make that possible. And first of all, I would like to call on stage Gert Overt and Pirit Urp. I hope Pirit is in the room. I was trying to find out how many hours they spent. I was talking to your boss last night. They said one, a half a year, one person. <laughs> Not sure if you would agree to that. We believe. Don't frighten off uh, future host countries. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not true. It was about 10% of this action. <laughs> okay. But we believe you might enjoy a good glass of champagne <laughs> after all this stress. <laughs> Thank you very much. Don't Thank open you. it now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Spread it all over the place like the Formula One drivers. Thank you. For us, it has been a real pleasure of, of hosting you, and, and, it, and it has been an immense pleasure that so many of you uh, showed up actually here. So we, we were wondering about the numbers from the beginning. Who will come? We are in a distant northeastern corner of Europe uh, with maybe not the most access by airplanes uh, compared to Brussels or any of the European hubs, but all of you came, and we are super happy, and thank you once again. Thank you. And then I would also uh, call upon the stage our co-host Heike Siebel and Maria Kirsti. Maria, are you still here? So, Heike, then you can drink it alone. <laughs> okay, and there, uh, of course, have been involved a lot of other people from the Eurodic Secretariat, and I would call upon Claudia and, and Rainer. Please come to stage. Claudia uh, was actually the one who was running behind the org teams, uh, getting them to deliver their content in time, and Rainer was responsible for all um, digital matters, wiki, website, and so on. Thank you very much. Then Wolf Ludwig, our well-known... <laughs> well-known... Uh, Foreign Minister, I would say no. <laughs> well, thank you. And um, with a new format of the Youth Stick this year, we had uh, we could only do this with the great help of Katja and uh, Ekaterina. Where are you? There you are. And also very much in the background, but very important for all those who could not physically, physically present, Bernard Zadaka. He was managing all the remote participation issues. Bernard, are you in the room? Yeah. There you are. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Bernard is truly an expert when it comes to remote participation. We usually fly him in from Lebanon. But he is actually really a global, a global expert on this. And then I think we also have to thank our technical team, the host organizer team. What, what was there, the company? Conference expert. Conference expert. So if you do a conference in Tallinn at one time, I think they are a reliable and good partner. Thomas Gerd, did we forget anyone? 
Uh, I would also like to thank the staff of Swiss Hotel for uh, the venue and also Kulturigatel for the evening gala venue. Both have been excellent and uh, especially, I mean, this all would not be possible. Eurodig and everything we do here with, uh, with WebEx, YouTube, streaming, all the mics, the sound. So Marco's team from Videal, all the technical equipment has worked amazingly. This was what we were afraid of the most, to see if we can actually pull it up. But this is Estonia and we did. So <laughs> thank you. And I did forget one, our captioning team captioned first, they are invisible, but you see what they write down in each of the sessions and this transcript as well as the videos will be provided on our wiki so you can search what has been discussed years after. Thank you very much, uh, kudos to you for coming so numerous, being here in the morning and late in the evening and enjoy the rest of the sunny day of Tallinn. I think we where we were lucky to get the best weather uh, possible for this wonderful city. Bye-bye. Uh, wait, wait, Sandro. Um, <laughs> how, how, many, how many of these chocolate packages are for you? Because, of course, we cannot leave without uh, thanking you, because this is Sandra Hoferichter, and she's the Secretary General of Eurodic, as you may know, and she has led uh, this uh, ship through uh, all the storms that uh, were uh, occurring in the last year, and... Uh, Yes, thank you for everything, Sandra, and thanks to the audience. Bye. Austin.